Good afternoon. Friends, colleagues, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been exactly two years since uh, I've been to Vietnam. And in those short two years, definitely there's been change in the wider world, certainly change in the United States, probably change in Asia, and potentially change in the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. I've entitled this talk, U.S.-Vietnam Relations in the New Era and Beyond. So before I begin sort of my extended presentation about U.S.-Vietnam relations in the new era and beyond, I'd like to start with a story that hopefully will help capture uh, my views on the future of the relationship. So take yourself back to July 2013. In the morning of July 25th, it was a very bright, very humid morning in Washington. Um, I walked into the Oval Office to brief President Obama. At that point, I had been uh, at the National Security Council for four years. I had grown accustomed to just about everything that you experience working in the White House. Incredible access to people and information, lots of once-in-a-lifetime type of experiences, meeting the Dalai Lama multiple times, of course, the very heavy, consequential national security decisions that you make, and then, of course, just simply the relentless pace of working at the National Security Council. We used to refer to it as a sprint-a-thon. In other words, you were sprinting in a marathon at, the, at the, sort of at the same time. But the one thing that you never got used to, and certainly I never became jaded about, was briefing the president. It was always hard, and it always required intensive preparation. It was daunting. I would always get a pit at the bottom of my stomach the minute I walked in that room. So on this sort of bright, humid morning, I walk into the Oval Office, and I sit down on the sofa. The way it's configured is there's two seats in the front, president and vice president, and then two sofas. So I sat down on the sofa, but the awkward thing is the sofas in the Oval Office are way too comfortable. They're perfect for watching a movie. They're horrible for briefing. So you sit down on the sofa and you sort of sink into it, which is not the posture you want if you're briefing President Obama. Across from me on the other side of the sofa was Penny Pritzker, the Secretary of Commerce, Mike Froman, U.S. Trade Representative, and Susan Rice, the National Security Advisor. Now they were sitting back, they were looking very comfortable because it was my job to brief the President. Obama gave me his sort of usual, very intensive stare that was both highly attentive, but also distant and a little bit skeptical. You had to prove yourself in each and every briefing with Obama. So I began by saying, Mr. President, today I've come to talk to you about an incredible strategic opportunity for the United States in Asia. And he sort of stopped me, he lifted up his head and he said, Evan, everybody else walks into this office and they bring me problems and they bring me crises, so this better be good. So I proceeded to describe to him about how the upcoming visit, uh, visit of a president from a prominent Asian country would allow us to, at once, bend the arc of history toward reconciliation, help move the Asia-Pacific past the vestiges of the Cold War ideological competition, help put in place a new set of global rules and norms on trade and investment that would unleash enormous prosperity, and we could help to create a strategic environment in the Asia-Pacific where countries are free from coercion, from rising powers who are exploring the limits of their capabilities. So Obama said, wow, that sounds pretty good. What do you have in mind? Of course, I was talking about Vietnam. This was my briefing to President Obama 
the morning before President Tsang arrived in Washington, met President Obama in the Oval Office, and importantly, we announced for the first time the creation of the U.S.-Vietnam Comprehensive Partnership. That was four and a half years ago, and so much has changed since, since then. And that's what I'd like to talk about for a few minutes. What has changed? What is the new era? And then I'd like to talk about the and beyond part. What might the future hold? So what is this new era? Well, my conceptualization of the new era has three parts. Economics, politics, geopolitics, and let me talk about each one briefly. But I think it's important to understand that this new era in U.S.-Vietnam relations is not all about Trump. Rather, the new era is about broader structural shifts in the world, in Asia, within both our countries, that will directly and indirectly, positively and negatively, impact the U.S.-Vietnam relations. Globally, the world is in a moment where core issues are being debated. Global governance, or what constitutes global governance at the international level, state-society relations, the role of the market versus the role of the state at the national level. These are not ordinary times in international relations. So let me talk about global economics for a minute. The global economy, trade, investment, finance, are evolving in new and important ways. And some of them, I think, are being masked by the current period of synchronized global growth and the uptick in global trade. 2017 was a great year for the global economy. There are four trends that I'm most focused on in terms of global economics. First, globalization understood as lowering barriers to goods, services, capital, ideas, people, is no longer progressing in a linear or a rapid manner. The progress curve, if you were going to plot the progress curve of globalization, it is no longer steep and it is no longer linear. Simply put, it's no longer widely accepted that reduced barriers to these flows of goods, services, capital ideas, etc., is universally a good thing for all people and all countries. Countries like the United States and the EU are actively debating how open they should be. Now, that's very easy to forget in this part of the world because so many Asian countries like Vietnam have benefited from globalization and access to developed markets. China loves open markets just as long as it's not China's market. And then, of course, there's lots of debates about protectionism. That means that economic nationalism is on the rise, Trade agreements probably are going to be more regional than global. And progress on trade and investment liberalization is probably going to decelerate for a few years. Asia may be the exception to that. I'm deeply encouraged by the prospect of TPP 11 or TPP 10, whatever it ends up being. We'll see. I hope so. Second. The global economy has not fully recovered from the global financial crisis. The big and final step in the global recovery from the, glo the financial crisis is just starting. In other words, the withdrawal of quantitative easing programs by the US, the EU, and perhaps Japan. Interest rates may rise. We don't really know how fast, but they're certainly moving in that direction. This could be depending on what market expectations are, depending how rapidly they rise, depending on whether or not there are exogenous shocks. This could be a volatility-inducing event uh, if rates start going higher, and of course that affects currencies. This is going to require very strong national financial st uh, systems and a strong attention to resilience. Simply put, countries with weak banking systems are vulnerable. Third, China is rapidly emerging as a center of gravity of the global economy, and this carries both upside and downside risks. Xi Jinping has very substantially consolidated his power. He's adopted a robust blueprint of reforms, 
related to financial de-risking, environmental protection, poverty alleviation, industrial policy, etc. But China is not opening up more at home. And it has a very aggressive strategy for external economic influence. Belt and Road, AIIB, Chinese outward investment clearly is their big new economic and political tool. And China is not shy about using its economic linkages for political purposes. Just ask policymakers in Norway, Taiwan, the Philippines, South Korea, and even Vietnam, countries that, it, that have been at the other end of Chinese economic coercion. So as China rises as a center of gravity of the global economy, it's going to require adjustments for us all. Fourth and lastly, in terms of global economics, pay attention to the rise of robotics and automation in manufacturing. It's going to compress supply chains that have been geographically distributed, and it may result in the re-aggregation of consumption and production. And if you remember, the whole idea behind the second phase of globalization was that consumption and production could be disaggregated in order to take advantage of low-cost labor. This is going to impact Vietnam, but I don't know how it's going to impact Vietnam. But if China begins onshoring some of its manufacturing because it's now cheaper to hire robots than use labor in other countries, that's going to change the name of the game. And the question is, as economies like Vietnam seek to move up the value-added ladder in manufacturing, what happens if automation and robotics pulls that ladder up before countries like Vietnam can begin climbing? I don't know the answer to this question, but it's probably the most important uh, event in, I think, global manufacturing and technology in the next 10 years. So let me talk a little bit about politics, global politics, and how that's going to affect the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. And really the major development related to politics, and by politics I'm not talking about geopolitics, I'm talking about national level politics. What's going on in the political economies of countries all over the world? And the most prominent and important phenomena to pay attention to is the rise of populism. In other words, the rise of anti-establishment politics, the rise of popular support for political leaders that come, uh, that are from outside the established political parties and political practices of any country's political system. It's generally speaking driven by a sense of frustration and alienation by vocal groups from the political and the economic elites in countries all over the world. This is largely driven by structural economic and demographic trends. But importantly, populism is different in developed countries and developing countries. And that, it's that distinction that's relevant to our discussion today about the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. In the developed markets of the U.S. and the EU, the alienation and the frustration is largely due to economic shocks, immigration shocks, technology shocks, in other words, People who lost their jobs due, due to offshoring of manufacturing, automation, and in some places this was made worse by immigration. The same people who lost their jobs generally feel that the erosion of national boundaries is, has been a threat to their cultural and national cohesion. That was clearly a very important part of the dynamic that drove the Brexit decision. And it's these constituencies who feel in their daily lives, the economic shock of losing their jobs to automation or outsourcing, um, these are the ones that are, uh, have embraced assertive anti-establishment politics in the US and the EU. Whereas populism in developing countries, especially in Asia, is very, very different, but it's going to affect us all. It's not driven by an economic shock. It's really not driven by economic deprivation but rather the opposite phenomena of rising expectations of young populations searching for a better quality of life. They want more than just jobs and wages. That was good enough 10 or 15 years ago. Now what they want is better education, environmental protection, 
better transportation, better access to health care. They're online. They're connected via social media. They're making their views heard. And they're prepared to accept, or at least experiment with, politicians from outside established political classes. Look no further than the recent election of Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, Jokowi in Indonesia, Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar. Some leaders get this, and I think that's in part what's driving this intensive embrace of anti-corruption trends across Asia, India, China, even here in Vietnam. Because some leaders recognize that these populations who are demanding a better quality of life also want greater accountability and greater transparency from their government. Anti-corruption is one way to get at that. And I believe that these phenomena are alive and well in Vietnam. They don't threaten regime security, but they're certainly changing state society relations in the political economy of Vietnam. When I look at the fish kill or that incident in 2016, I think is a clear indication of this, this sort of desire for accountability, transparency from these young populations who are expecting more from their government. The third and last element of the new era for US-Vietnam relations is about geopolitics. And let me make a few points here. First, and the, mo the most obvious change in global politics in the last few years is the United States. Simply put, with the election of Donald Trump, the U.S. role is uncertain. Trump may re represent a very sharp break from seven decades of U.S. support for international order based on commonly held rules, norms, and institutions. At best, Trump is ambivalent about the so-called liberal international order. But keep in mind that fundamentally the U.S. right now is really focused on domestic issues, hence the focus on the trade deficit as opposed to more legitimate measures of um, bilateral, uh, bilateral trade relations. The United States went through periods like this in the 1970s and perhaps we're living through them once again. But I think we're simply going to have to get used to the fact that the U.S. is going to be a source of uncertainty more than predictability in the coming years. Second, China. It's an obvious point, but it's an important one to make, which is under Xi Jinping, China is rising in new and different ways. Economically, its external economic footprint will expand and deepen. China is now using its export of capital as a major tool to accomplish both its political and its economic objectives. Diplomatically, China has moved far beyond Deng Xiaoping. Gone are the days of keeping a low profile. Xi Jinping in his speech at the 19th Party Congress had a very, very important line in there where he started talking about the China option, the China alternative. And the question is, how much resonance is there going to be for this in other parts of the world? Militarily, China's presence in Asia is substantial and growing. Within 10 years, there will probably be four Chinese aircraft carriers operating in the Western Pacific, twice the number of submarines. By 2020, the Chinese Navy will have doubled from its size in 2010. This is going to change our strategic environment. And now, importantly, the Chinese see an enormous strategic opportunity before them. They see the election of Donald Trump and everything that came with it as a huge opportunity for them to step forward. Look no further than a major, very high-profile editorial in People's Daily yesterday that talked about the historic opportunity presented by the so-called democratic deficit all over the world to expand Chinese global influence. Under Xi, this is a very, very different China challenge we face. Third geopolitical trend, North Korea. The future of the Korean Peninsula is probably going to be the next major threshold event in Asia's geopolitics. 
This is a moment that will define or redefine power relationships among all the big powers. The ripple effects on ASEAN will be substantial. It could be a reorder, reordering moment for geopolitics in Asia. We simply cannot rule out the possibility of major power conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Fourth and lastly, we all need to be prepared for a new era in the U.S.-China relationship. It's going to be defined by tensions, friction, and consistent competition. U.S. frustration and anxiety with China is hitting new levels in the United States. Look at the language of the national security strategy. Expect a new baseline for higher and more intensive friction in the U.S.-China relationship. Now, U.S. tolerance for this level of friction and tension in the relationship uh, is untested. It's unclear how, um, how much tolerance there will be in Washington for this kind of relationship with China. But what that means is Asia and even ASEAN will become a crucible of major power competition in a multilateral world even more than it is today. Is Vietnam aware of this trend line and is it ready for what this means? And that's where I'd like to turn now. The, the sort of the future of the US-Vietnam relationship. I see many possible trajectories for the relationship. Ambassador Crittenbrink was very eloquent this morning about the robust agenda for the US-Vietnam relationship. I fully agree. It's a diverse agenda, it's a deep agenda, and Fulbright University is a perfect example of what can be done. When I spoke in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, this very hotel two years ago, I talked about the untapped and enormous potential of the relationship. I used the metaphor of a glass ceiling to describe my view of our collective future. At once we can see the possibilities, but we can't always reach them in a timely manner but because of a variety of political, strategic, ideological barriers on both sides. I'm not blaming one side or the other, it's just the nature of the relationship, hence the glass ceiling. And I still think that this is an apt metaphor. But in the last two years, but really in the last year, I've come to believe that there is another appropriate image to describe the relationship, the glass floor. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean we both are worried about the foundation of the relationship under our feet. How strong and enduring is it? And will it break or at least crack and undermine our respective national interests if we put too much weight on it too fast. So we hedge our bets about each other. My sense is that this feeling may be stronger in Vietnam than in the United States. So when I think about the US-Vietnam relationship and this glass floor constraint, there are really two issues that come to mind. The first is the issue of uncertainty and the second is the issue of balance. These two ideas, uncertainty and balance, are central to how we both think about the other and the future of this relationship. And I think we need to understand what both mean and the role that they play if we're really going to ever enjoy the potential of the relationship. So please indulge me for a moment in discussing each one of these ideas. On uncertainty, first and foremost, American strategists and policymakers focused on Asia understand Vietnam's strategic predicament and strategic imperatives. You're fiercely independent and want to maintain your strategic autonomy. You don't want to choose between or among partners. You're searching for leverage in much of what you do with us and with other countries. And we respect these imperatives and believe that there is ample room within them for US-Vietnam cooperation. So when it comes to your uncertainty about American strategic uh, intentions, we get it. We understand that our staying power, especially now, looks a little bit unpredictable. This is concern is obviously acute now under a new president with the withdrawal of TPP, Paris, and broader question about our commitment to the liberal international order. 
But let me suggest you think about uncertainty in a few different ways. First, the United States can never provide the kind of uncertainty you want absent an alliance. In other words, uncertainty is an issue to be managed in the relationship and shouldn't be seen as a barrier to progress. Second, look at the overwhelming consistency of US foreign and national security policy over the last 70 years, especially after the Cold War, toward the Asia Pacific. Look at how America defines its strategic interests. They are remarkably consistent and very bipartisan when it comes to the Asia Pacific. Certain strategic realities, like China's rise, are not going away, they're only intensifying. Third, let's use uncertainty as a positive force in the US-Vietnam relationship. Use it to drive toward more cooperation, more communication, more interaction, and to build a deeply institutionalized relationship. Only this kind of effort can reduce uncertainty. Fourth, let's both take actions and let's experiment, but let's not go too slow because that might generate a little resentment. Look at what the Obama administration did between 2013 and 2016. It's substantial in most areas. In those three years, from the beginning of the Co Comprehensive Partnership to welcoming your General Secretary to the Oval Office, it's remarkable what was accomplished in three short years. And then, of course, President Obama's trip here in 2016. Fifth, and lastly, on the issue of uncertainty, People-to-people -people ties have to be part of it. It is essential. It is fundamental. And that comes from sort of a hardcore policymaker in the very heights of the National Security Council. Only through deeply institutionalized, deeply rooted connections at all levels of society can we really eliminate uncertainty. Second, let me talk about balance. I think both sides constantly engage in a struggle to balance US-Vietnam relations with their other strategic interests. Usually this means China, not always, but usually. So here's the issue with balance. We both need it, we both seek it, we both know the other needs it and seeks it, but sometimes one side needs it a little bit more than the other, or at least they think they do. So let me be very clear. The United States does not and should not want Vietnam or any country in Southeast Asia to choose between the United States and China. US policy toward Vietnam, the heart, the very core of the comprehensive partnership, and I know because I negotiated it, was an explicit understanding that no fundamental choice existed for Vietnam. We, are, we were offering the freedom not to choose. But we need to be careful because that quest for balance, that that quest for balance does not become an overall constraint on expanding our bilateral relationship. Collectively, balance has to provide direction and momentum to the relationship. So clearly, this is going to be a challenge for both sides. Friends and colleagues, in closing, I'd like to go back to the story that I began my speech with, take you back to the Oval Office in July of 2013. After briefing Obama for about an hour, everybody gave their presentations, and Obama said to me, he said, okay, Evan, great, I think we're all set for President Song, is there anything else? And I said, no. So I started to put my materials together, and he turned to me and he said, Evan, I think it's important for me to let them know that we respect them. We respect their sacrifices their accomplishments, Vietnam's choices, and their risks in getting closer with us. I said, Mr. President, that's exactly right. I knew at that moment that I had an opening and that the next big step was getting the General Secretary into the Oval Office as the ultimate sign of respect. And you all know how that story ends. Thank you very much. <laughs>